Um, glad to have Carrie Carajalius today, who is a Berkman Fellow, and she comes to us from the University of Illinois, where she leads a social spaces group. Um, she's also an MIT alum and studied with another Berkman Fellow, Judith Donna. Um, and we're glad to have her today to talk about text and tie strength. So, Carrie. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'm just going to warn you guys a bit ahead of time. I probably will go over my 15 minutes, but I'd like to keep this pretty informal. So if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to jump right in. Um, I'm going to talk today primarily about text and tie strength. Um, this I tend to show this slide a lot in my talks, mostly because I think we forget just how um, um, how important people are, and we're all here, and a lot of our technology actually deals with how people interact with each other. And the bulk of my talk is going to be about the connections between people. This is a quote by William White, who was a sociologist who actually studied public spaces and how people used public spaces. Um, one of the interesting things he noted was that you know people flock to spaces with you know light, with trees, um, with water, but the number one thing people wanted was a place to sit. And it's, the reason I bring this up, it's how often we design spaces as if we don't want people to actually hang out there. What is this equivalent of the seat in a virtual space? So bulk of my talk is going to deal with text. Um, this is the first known text that um, people have found. This was actually a Sumerian um, text found in 3300 BC. Um, and what's interesting about this is it's archived. Not maybe archived the way things are archived online, but it's an archival version that we can still peruse today and we can still make inferences about it. Um, a lot of the early work that I did when I was at graduate school was some of the early work on sentiment analysis. Um, this actually is a snapshot of the Usenet group, soch.culture.greece. And what this was showing actually on the right is angry messages were red, um, peaceful messages were green, um, news was another color. Um, so this was a very irate group. Um, and again, this was all influenced by text. Um, a lot of the later work that we did, I'm not going to talk about today, I'm just going to talk about it ever so briefly just so you see what kind of work that my research group does. Um, everything we do deals with communication. Um, in this particular case, we're doing visualizations of people around a tabletop. Um, each person is a different color, and what we found here was that if you show people a visualization of their contribution, they tend to balance interaction. Um, we looked at turn-taking, and we're actually using these visualizations to teach turn-taking to children with Asperger's. On the lower right, you can see the snapshot of somebody talking and then just one little sliver of color in there. That's somebody going, yeah, or aha. Uh -huh. um, it turns out people make stories about these visualizations. So for example, they say the red person is the leader, you know, the green person is like the follower. Um, this visualization here on the left, this might be indicative of me speaking today. I'll be blue and I'll be totally dominating this conversation, not letting many other people get a word in, most probably done other visualizations where we incorporate voting into the visualization. And one of the things that we found in these is that even if outcome people want doesn't actually happen, they like the idea of having their vote actually embedded into the visualization in real time, almost as if like a Carrie was here feature. I was here. I was listened to. Um, I'm present in this community. Um, we did some other visualizations where we actually uh, did archivals of meetings. Um, and this actually is a textual archive where you can see um, you know, one third of conversations started talking about downtown, then lunch, then social. Um, another part of the conversation drifted off, split off, talked about wine. Um, and we actually had to build our own topic clustering for this because it turns out lots of existing topic clustering today um, is built off of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and people don't talk in third person. They don't always talk about the Iraq war. Um, but um, talking about um, Thai strength. A lot of this work was influenced by our early work looking at how different people in different areas use social media. So for example, um, I grew up in a very, very small village in Greece. Um, at the time, it was about 1,000 people. Right now, it's probably 300 people. And one of the things that struck me when I was there was that um, every Sunday, my dad, who was in the US, would call at noon. Um, and I would wait at the one phone call in the village to get that um, to get that call. It was in a tavern, so they'd serve like liquor there, coffee. People would be paying backgammon. Um, so every Sunday at noon, I'd go wait for that phone call, and about you know 10 to 15 other people would show up to listen to my half of the conversation. It was almost as if um, you know that was you know advertised um, entertainment there. TV didn't start until five o'clock. Um, but this one phone was kind of like this hub. Everyone went there, and if you were bored, you know you just kind of hung out there to see who might call. Um, later on in 84, you know, my grandfather got the first phone in the village. Um, and it didn't make that much sense because there was nobody else to call. So what happened was that people started showing up there waiting for phone calls from the US. So you know, the house became a nice hub. But 
one of the things that I want to stress with this is how people use phones differently in different parts of the world, in different rural, especially rural and urban areas. Um, in the United States, rural and urban areas use the phone very differently. In fact, most people don't realize that prior to 1920, there were more phones in rural America than there were in urban America. Um, and in looking at the telegraph, looking at the telephone, looking at the internet, um, people have to use them differently in rural and urban areas. And one of the things that we wanted to find out was why and how. So just going to slightly to definition of, of rural, uh, rural town is a town with less than 2,500 people not connected to a metropolitan area. Um, Urbana is urban by this definition. Um, we're quite close to Chicago. We're about um, 40,000 people. Champaign's about 70,000 people. Just to give you a feel for what this is like around the world, 24% of the U.S. population is rural. 50% um, of the world's population is rural. Um, and this image here isn't rural versus urban, but just to give you a context for looking at the lights at night, just how much of the, what little part of the world is actually lit up at night. Um, so one of the things that we were interested in doing with in this work, and uh, this work is actually done with my graduate student, Eric Gilbert, um, we wanted to see how people use social media differently in urban and rural spaces, just to get like a starting off point to see what these interfaces should look like or, and compare them to what they do look like. So we decided to just sample random zip codes from rural and urban areas. This is an example of one of the rural areas that we looked at. And this is 100 West Virginia, population of 344. Um, and we wanted to see just what parameters people use differently. Um, this is an uh, example from, uh, I just, I love this picture. It's from Claude Fisher's book, America Calling, um, actually, Social History of the Telephone, America, America Calling, Social History of the Telephone. And it shows pictures of people using the phone and how the phone actually makes farm life enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Um, not only that, but the old time isolation and loneliness of farm life is a thing of the past once you have the telephone. Um, at the time, actually, rural people loved party lines. This idea of, like, it's almost like a subnet if you think of it in terms of networking terms. You could pick up the phone and almost listen in on what other people were saying. Um, urban people decided that this was passe, this was not the way telephones should be used, um, and telephone companies agreed with them in many ways. Um, this is a, a quote that kind of illustrates this, where it says, farmers as a class are troublesome customers to handle and are apt to have an exaggerated idea of their own rights. The bumptiousness of certain farmers can be overcome only by constant efforts to educate them. This is by a telecom exec in 1918, also from the Claude Fisher book. So what we did is um, we sampled um, MySpace, in particular 3,000 public users, um, total of 340,000 online friendships, 200,000 interpersonal messages. Um, this is a sampling just so you get a feel for the zip codes of the U.S. Um, this is a sampling of what we did um, for our study. Um, the demographics that we had were about um, roughly even rural to urban. Um, one of the things that I want to stress when you look at the MySpace ID, the reason that's longer is because the later you log into MySpace, the larger your ID number is. So you can see the difference between how often rural people actually, when they logged in versus when urban people logged in. Ages were roughly similar. Day since last login quite different. Rural people about four days, urban people about 10 days. So we had about five hypotheses in doing this work. And these hypotheses were actually built off of literature and theories from face-to-face -face work in sociology. So our first hypothesis was that um, people in rural areas will have fewer friends and comments on MySpace. Second hypothesis was that there will be more women on these um, social, um, social sites. Third hypothesis would be that there was more private profiles. And the fourth hypothesis was that the friends would be closer geographically. Fifth hypothesis would there be a preference for strong ties over weak ties in rural areas versus urban areas. Um, and one thing, just I mentioned the telegraph earlier. Um, every time this new technology came out, it was supposed to change the world, and it was supposed to democratize interaction conversation. Um, when the telegraph came out, they said people, people said that war would end because people could communicate, and there would be no misunderstandings. When the airplane came out, people felt that you know, you'd have no more war because people could just drop a bomb and who would ever do that? Um, but social media, a lot of this came out with the internet and with social media as well. So I'm not going to go into the depths of this talk, uh, in, of this study, but I want to tell you what hypothesis we proved and what we couldn't prove to lead into our tie strength work. So for example, we did find that yes, rural people did have fewer friends and comments. Um, uh, rural people had more women involved. And not only were there more women involved, but women were also the keepers of privacy in these sites. Um, there were more private profiles in um, rural areas, in rural profiles, and their friends were geographically closer. What we could not prove or disprove was that uh, rural people had a preference for strong ties over weak ties, as is the case in face-to-face um, -face interaction. Um, there were several reasons we couldn't prove this. One of them is that 
there isn't a really um, accepted quantified approach for what is a strong tie and what is a weak tie. People use this quite a bit in literature, um, but it's very hard to use in practice and it's hard to actually generalize what it means to be a strong tie versus a weak tie. One of the things that we found from this work was that um, the rural and urban areas were very much disconnected in terms of where their friends were. It's kind of hard to see in this, in this picture. But one of the things, and this may sound kind of extreme, but maybe there are two MySpaces, you know, a rural MySpace and an urban MySpace. And what can we do as designers and technologists to actually bridge that gap? Because we found that people in rural spaces wanted to communicate more with people online. They wanted to have more conversations. They wanted to friend more people. But there were issues of trust. But going back to that issue of tie strength, um, we decided because we couldn't find a good metric to actually come up with um, to prove or disprove our hypothesis, we wanted to interrogate that a little bit more and try to figure out what tie strength really means online, how different tie strength is online from offline. So we decided to explore Facebook. Um, this is a snapshot of um, you know, my Facebook profile from way back. Um, and one of the interesting things about Facebook is that you know you see a list of people, but people are essentially friends or strangers. Either they're on that list or they're not on that list. So it's quite binary. Um, and someone who um, I talked to who's on this list that you know was a dog breeder that I've maybe spoken to once in my life has the same presentation as um, you know my husband who I hopefully talk to every day or more. Um, just as a snapshot of what my Facebook profile looked like this summer, um, this is what the connections look like. And this is made using a structural tool called Guess. And I kind of like this image because it looks like a question mark. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this is that there's like three different people down here. These are my only three relatives in Greece with a computer, just also to show you the difference between a rural and urban space um, in terms of using social media. And everyone else, I mean, they're disconnected from everyone else. And one of the things that I, I'm showing this image to stress is that a lot of this is actually built on structural data um, from Facebook. And in terms of full disclosure, I should say that just having this image up here actually does violate Facebook's terms of service, which is a different issue I'm not going to get into today, but in terms of the ethical implications of um, what this means. But tie strength. Um, tie strength was probably coined by Mark Renovetter. Um, I would say in the in the 70s. Um, he'd been studying this way before that, but his definition is the strength, well, he what his claims about tie strength are that the strength of a tie is probably linear combination of the amount of time, emotional intensity and intimacy, um, and the reciprocal services which characterize the tie. Um, what does this mean in layman terms? Strong ties are people you trust. For example, if I wanted to borrow $100,000 from someone, I would probably go to a strong tie. My parents, um, you know, my brother, um, my husband, um, also, strong ties have been shown to actually help people in corporations get through difficult times. Strong ties help people in grieving um, situations if they've lost somebody. Strong ties also can have the opposite effect sometimes. If somebody in your social network is a strong tie gets depressed, there's a higher probability that you might get depressed as well. Weak ties, on the other hand, are acquaintances. So for example, a friend of a friend, someone you went to high school with, you know, a college buddy. And for the longest time, people thought that you know to lead a healthy, protective life, all you really needed was lots and lots of strong ties. Um, and then Mark Renovetter wrote this really great book called Getting a Job. And what he wrote in his book is how he emphasized how you really need weak ties to actually make this happen. Because your strong ties know all the same people, whereas your weak ties get, the tentacles of them get dispersed more throughout the continent, more throughout the world. And you actually get more um, information dispersed that way and new information that you would not have gotten from your strong ties. So um, um, this work, I want to say, is also done with my PhD student, Eric Gilbert, who's on the job market right now. Um, so what we did with Facebook was we wanted to look at what tie strength meant. So we looked, um, just as an aside, there's over 7,000 papers that cite the strength of weak ties, the seminal paper by Mark Grunewetter. And at the end of this paper, you know, he hints at this continuum between strong and weak, but doesn't so much explicitly state it. So a lot of the work to date actually says this is a strong tie, this is a weak tie. And they, they come to these calculations by saying how many times people have spoken to each other. And if they've spoken to each other over 10 times, that's a strong tie. And if they've spoken to each other less than 10 times, that's a weak tie. We wanted to see if we could tease that out a bit more and maybe find out if this is a continuum and if so, how it's a continuum. So adding on to the existing work, um, Grenevetter discussed in the previous quote, intensity, intimacy, duration, and services. Um, we really wanted to add a bit more and try to add on to the existing work. And we're intrigued by Wellman's um, ideas of emotional support 
um, and his added work on intimacy, um, the idea of Nandlin's social distance and um, Bert's um, structural connections. Um, and actually, he has a really new, good new book out right now. So essentially, our task was looking at Facebook. How can we take Facebook and actually map something to a face-to-face -face, um, -face -face environment? Um, in a way to do this that it's practical, that's interesting, and actually can influence design decisions in our work. So what we did is we brought people into a lab setting, and I'm not going to get also into the ethical implications of sampling and doing all this online work, but we brought people into our lab, and um, we ran our algorithms, and we had them actually choose, fill out these forms that were designed using GraceMonkey. So for example, we asked them questions such as, um, you know, how strong is your relationship with this person? Um, how would you feel asking this friend to loan you $100 or more? I yes. I think back one time, but I realize I'm trying to figure out. What exactly are you trying to map? What are the two things you're, you're mapping? So we have these, we took over 70 different parameters from Facebook, and we're trying to map them to tie strength, how strong somebody's relationship is. Okay. So for example, okay. looking at all these parameters, we're going to come up with a number between 0 and 1 that tells you how strong a tie you are between this other person. Um, and to help us build our model, we needed something to, to map our algorithm against. So um, the third question we asked was, how helpful would this person be if you were looking for a job? How upset would you be if this person unfriended you? Um, and if you left Facebook for another social site, how important would it be to bring this friend along? Um, one of the interesting things that happened with Friendster, um, if many of you remember, is that it kind of disappeared in a very short amount of time. And we're interested in, uh, did people bring their close friends with them somewhere else, or did they just sort of like just scatter and regroup someplace else. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on this first question, which is how strong is your relationship with this person? So what we did is we assessed over um, 2,000 friendships. Um, and this is from 35 university students and staff. So um, of these 35, 23 were female. Um, on average, there were about 150 friends per participant. Um, and again, we looked at over 70 uh, numerical indicators that we scanned to build our model. Um, I'm not going to go over all 70 of these in detail because you'll get really, really bored if I do that. But I'm going to give you a sampling of the ones we used in seven different categories. Um, the first category is intensity. And what we looked at there was we looked at um, initiated wall posts, uh, friend initiated wall posts, uh, wall words exchange. We also looked at the inbox, which is why we brought people into the lab and we didn't do this using a Facebook app. So we looked at uh, inbox messages together, thread depth, um, status updates from friends. In terms of intimacy variables, we looked at participants, friends, days since last communication, wall intimacy words, index intimacy words. And we did a lot of this using sentiment analysis. Um, we looked at predictive variables of social distance. And these are um, you know, age difference, educational difference, political, occupational difference. Um, the traditional um, structure stuff that many people do. Um, we looked at uh, reciprocal services, such as links exchanged by wall in terms of uh, reciprocity, applications people had in common, uh, positive emotion yeah. words, negative emotion words in terms of emotional support. And we looked at duration, because duration really does play a key role. And that's probably one of the reasons people have been using it as a proxy for so long. And I'm going to skip to show you right now the results of some of our work in terms of what the model told us. So these are the seven different. Um, classifications of things that we looked at within Facebook. So you see structure, you see emotional support, services, social distance, duration, intensity, intimacy. And although not one of these monopolizes um, our model or the strength of our model, it was really interesting to me to note that intimacy, which is this one right here, plays such a big role in it. You know, alone, it probably wouldn't be the best indicator, but when you build this together, and you look at something like intimacy and something like emotional support and structure, which was primarily used in the past, you can just see how much more this idea of intimacy actually adds into the connection between people um, than without it. So um, you know, what does this mean? So we came up with these variables. One of the things that we also found was that you know, if people want to build something from our work, Using these 70 plus variables doesn't make that much sense, especially if you want to generalize. So we found that we, if you take sort of like the first 15 of them, it turns out you get more than 50% of the power of our algorithm. And many of these, um, just to get a feel for one of the most predictive elements, were days since last communication, days since first communication, intimacy time structural. And if, if you want to go into more depth than that, yes? Just a, a point of clarification, you're using the uh, quantitative data from the Facebook profiles yes. to determine the qualitative responses to the survey. Yes, exactly. Thanks. Yeah. Why do you think days since first communication should be such a strong predictor of sentiment? Um, in my case, like for example, if you have a very strong tie, like my husband is a strong tie, 
Um, we don't communicate with each other on Facebook at all. And it, literature suggests and shows, actually, that strong ties connect, connect, uh, talk to each other on a various, various platforms. So we talk to each other face to face. We use the phone. We use email. But Dayson's first communication probably was a big indicator for us. So maybe when you first log into Facebook, the first people you log in, the first people you connect to tend to be your very, very strong ties. Okay. And what's interesting is that even though he and I communicate almost zero on Facebook, you know, it could still bring that out as a, as a connection between us. Yes. You mentioned intimacy in the phone is not a very good indicator. Can you mention a couple of words why? Um, well, that's the interesting thing about building models is that when you have different parameters, um, you know, just just by itself, it's, it's going to give you a good proxy, but it's not going to give you the most accurate story. Um, so when people were using, you know, duration of conversation, like how, how much you talk to people, like a standard thing people have done, us included, was just saying, look, if you talk to somebody more than 10 times, it was a strong tie. If you talk to somebody less than 10 times, that was a weak tie. It's also not a bad proxy, but again, that leaves out intimacy. It leaves out all these other factors. We tried to bring in several of these things together to see if we could get a better indicator. Um, and I should have had the slide. I didn't bring it. But it turns out using the previous techniques, um, your, your results are like maybe something like you know, 50 to 60 percent of, you know, is this actually a strong tie versus a weak tie? Whereas our results of strong tie to weak tie are 87 percent. Yes? When you said that intimacy made up 37 percent of, what does it make up 37 percent of? I didn't quite understand. Oh, the power of the model. So it turns out that the intimacy features give us um, that much, add that much more accuracy to our model. Like, what are you measuring it against to know that your model is that is 37 percent accurate? Oh, no, of the total, of the total. So of all the things that make our model work, that accounted for 37% of it. Does that make sense? I'll let it go for now. Yeah, OK. Right. We can talk about that more in depth okay. if you'd like. Um, so the reason I have this slide up here is that if somebody wanted to make a quick and dirty version of this, um, they don't have to use all 70 plus features. They could use you know, a subset of them. But one of the things that I found interesting about this was not just when it worked, but when it didn't work. So um, this is actually a quote from one of our subjects. Um, she said, ah, yes, this friend is an old ex. We haven't really spoken to each other in about six years, but we ended up friending each other on Facebook when I first joined. But he's still important to me. We were best friends for seven years before we dated. So I read it at where I did. I was actually thinking of rating it higher because I'm optimistically hoping we'll recover some of our best friendness after a while. Hasn't happened yet, though. Um, so this is an interesting case where you have like the, the dumper versus the dumpy, whereas the person who um, you know, did the dumping usually evaluate somebody higher than somebody who actually was hurt by the situation. But this also brings up another interesting point in that tie strength is strong. And there's a very, very fine line between love and hate. And hate can also be a very, very strong tie. And one of the reasons that I mention this is because um, we really start, we need to start looking at the strength of positive and negative ties. And Kleinberg is starting to do some really good work in this area. Um, but Maybe our algorithm didn't tease out the positive and the negative at very well. Maybe it brought, we, we have this assumption here that it's a positive strong tie, and that's what's um, built into our model. Another example of where this didn't work is when people have these weird feuds and they use people's profiles as proxies. So for example, we were neighbors for a few years. I babysat her child multiple times. She comes over for parties. I'm pissed off at her right now, but it's still 0.8. Her little son, now three, has an account on Facebook. We usually communicate with each other on Facebook via her son's account. This is our one mutual friend. And this is fascinating to me for several reasons. Like One, because technically you need to be 13 years old to have an account on Facebook. And two, in many ways, they're using this as their proxy. I mean, they are communicating. Our model will not pick this up because it assumes that, you know, it assumes that when you're, you're honest, you're saying who you say you are. Um, you're um, communicating with people. You're not using somebody else's account to communicate. So again, um, I'm not surprised I didn't pick this out. But in many ways, I think where our model breaks is far more interesting than where it works. So um, why do we care? Let's say we have a model for predicting tie strength. And let's say I can tell that you know, my tie strength with you is 0.5, whereas my tie strength with you might be 0.7. You know, where does this matter? Um, how can we use this? Um, so one example of where this might matter is in terms of um, you know, possible friending scenarios um, on Facebook where people are, you know, maybe you should friend this person, maybe you should friend that person. The typical standard thing that people have done in the past. We wanted to see what it, what it means in the world of design and the world of applications. So for example, in our earlier work when I talked about the rural and urban spaces, um, you know, how can we design differently to account for different types of users? Maybe we don't need one interface for all. Maybe different people need different interfaces. Um, how can we use this work to influence design in Facebook? So one example might be in the privacy settings for Facebook. 
you know, I'm a relatively intelligent person, you know, I have a doctorate, and yet getting through all these privacy settings in Facebook can be somewhat of a nightmare sometimes. What if you were to use um, something like this to actually start organizing your photographs? So for example, you know, your strong ties saw a different subset of photographs, your weak ties saw a different subset, and then you can drag and drop in between or make even more categories um, that you might want. Um, and again, this is just to make your life a little bit easier. Um, in, our, in our average, you know, people had roughly 150 friends. Um, um, in my, my students, for example, have many, many more friends than that. Trying to make a, a profile for 500 people to see individual photographs can be quite, um, can be a nightmare. But not only that, okay, so we built this model, and this model happened to work for Facebook in 2008. Um, what does this mean in 2010? What does this mean in 2020? Um, and what does it mean um, in other online environments? Um, so we wanted to see, you know, can this generalize to an, any other different world? And we were infatuated with Twitter at the time, so we decided to see how can we use our model, will our model work with Twitter? So this is um, um, a different social site. I know many of you are on it because I follow many of you. Um, so. Twitter is quite different from Facebook for several different reasons. I mean, one, it has a very different model. It does not have the reciprocity that Facebook has. Um, but it's, it has a lower barrier to entry in many ways. And, um, and it has a huge population. And so it seemed like an interesting approach to see, well, let's take our model, adapt it to Twitter, and see how well it works. So what we did is we took the same parameters that worked in our Facebook model. So we basically built a model on Facebook. We took those same things. We morphed them onto Twitter because not everything maps perfectly. For example, you don't have an inbox in Twitter to look at intimacy words there. And then what we did is um, we built an interface. So I'm going to switch into live demo mode now, um, which usually is the kiss, kiss of death for me, but I'm going to try it anyway. Um, but I'm going to do that um, because, one, it's going to be far more interesting for people to actually see what it does instead of me just talking over a slide. So for example, um, this is my WeMetal account right here. And I don't have that many friends on WeMetal. I would classify myself as, uh, on Twitter, I would classify myself as a lurker. I'm addicted to it. Um, I adore it. Um, but I tend to be more private than, um, than many of the people that I follow. So I'm going to try to reload this again. Um, Sign in, and it verifies actually your, your login with, um, with your Twitter account. OK, so what do we see here? So I've logged into WeMetal, and this is the, we built our own different list application and client. So I'm going to show you two different things here. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you is the list, and then I'm going to show you is the client. But what does this list thing do? So Twitter recently announced Twitter lists, and they make um, basically lists of people that you can follow. Um, you know, Twitter was getting kind of cumbersome. You could follow maybe like thousands of people, and how do you get through all of these tweets at one time? By having these lists that you can create, or you can even follow other people's lists, um, you can actually have these interesting types of filters that you could look through. So what our algorithm did is it made you a list for an inner circle, and the inner circle are my strong ties. Um, so for example, Eric Gilbert, a PhD student, he's here. A colleague at UIUC is here. Um, this is Christian Sandvig, fellow fellow. Um, this is Lisa Nakamura. I'm not sure why this showed up as a strong tie for Kai. And this is Joni D'Amico at IBM. Are these people you follow? Or you these are people follow? I follow. These are people. Did you make these core lists, or did WeMetal do it for you? WeMetal did it for us. Ah. So WeMetal created these lists. Um, down here is my outer circle. Um, so um, people that I follow that I'm not very connected to. Um, so there's somebody here. <laughs> we'll work on that. We'll work on this. I mean, I am writing the talk up at the moment. So. And what we have here on the right is it builds communities for you. So it uses, um, in my case, because I don't follow that many people, it only built two communities. And this first one here, um, and you can change these names. So for example, in this one, it's probably, you know, in my case, a research community. Made up that name for you? It's, that's a default name we give people, and then we let them actually change it um, to make it what they want. And so if I call this research, <laughs> when I then log into Twitter, there will be a research list for me that I made based on these people. So there are some familiar faces here, like Esther is here, Dana is here. This is a different community. Um, so again, my student is here again, and we tend to publish in the same conferences. Um, if you go here, um, you start seeing easy to miss people that don't tweet as much. But 
maybe there are tweets that I want to see because they don't tweet as much as, um, as the norm. And here are eager tweeters, people who tweet a lot. Um, and I have to say, I'm like in love with Roger Ebert at the moment. I think he's just one of the wittiest Twitterers out there. And, um, but this is what my profile looks like. And you know, my profile is a bit, um, is a bit meager. We decided to add to this um, our own Twitter client. And please be patient with us. This is the second version of it out. It's been out now for maybe about um, two weeks. This is the second incantation of it. We had one out in the fall. We have about 600 users. Um, and we wanted to see is explore how people can actually use um, tie strength to um, look at their tweets. So for example, um, oh, here he is. This is, um, this is Ebert. Um, so I don't have that many strong ties up here. The weaker the tie, it goes into black and white. If it's a very strong tie, then um, the picture also appears bigger. So if I move up here, this is what we call, we try to you know, use a different type of term for zooming. We call this social zooming. There's lots of different types of zooming. Um, and so let's see if this will work. I'm sorry? Um, increase so, text size? Oh, increase text size. Let's see if this will, my mouse back. Groups are formed by doing some clustering on the, those so parameters, the, the ideas, variables. That we have this spectrum of strong and weak tie. And in this particular case, so what this means here, in the sense is this is my inner circle and this is my outer circle. So if I move closer to my inner circle, I get my strong ties. If I move closer to the outer circle, I get my weak ties. Um, this here is a time mode, and this is a collapsed mode. Sometimes we tweet because like the eager tweeters tweet so much, you don't want to open your page and see 20 tweets from the same person. You'll see like a highlighted tweet, and it'll say like plus 10 more. Um, let me see if I can increase this. I never increased the size of my... Um, Were those different groups that came before? How did they... Relate in to this, this case, it doesn't relate to, they will relate when you go to regular Twitter. But the groups that were in my inner circle will be the ones that show up, up higher, and the ones that were in my outer circle will show up lower. Uh, uh, thank you. Is that better? Okay, great. So in terms of my strong ties, if you notice my list before, these are my only two strong ties that have tweeted. And if I go to uh, my weak ties, oh, Okay, Carrie's talk is beginning. So my students are watching this talk. Um, if you go here to the weak ties, um, um, that's what's being said there. The interesting thing for me in playing with this interface for quite um, for these last few weeks is that I'm somewhat more interested in what my weak ties have to say than what my strong ties have to say because we're in the same community. I pretty much know what they're going to say. Um, not all of it, not all of it, but the, the idea here is to be able to actually explore and move back and forth between the different um, ties and see um, where people set it. So right now we'd like to see where people like to keep this, um, where people like to keep this, um, this bar. We also added some other features. Um, for example, you can, because it builds communities, you can show only your first community. Um, in this case, it would probably be what I titled research. And there's a good chance this is crashing right now. Communities and lists the same thing? I'm sorry? Are communities and lists the same thing? No, they're not lists. A community is actually um, a group of people that were decided to be a cluster using um, sort of Markov clustering in our case. But we made a community a list. So it's not the same thing, but one of the lists we defined were, was a community. So in theory, what this should show, if it worked, was positive tweets, meaning things that were um, positive, emoti um, positive emotion and negative emotion, people that post frequently in Oh, there's a frequent poster, so that actually worked. Um, and then people that post infrequently. And, um, and what do you use for sentiment analysis? We use um, primarily the work done by Cardi at, CM, at Cornell. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty simple approach, and it works really well and really fast on Twitter. So I highly recommend it if you want to start playing with, um, with sentiment. We've had some complaints about how things that are negative aren't really negative. Right. But, um, but before I before I move on, actually, well, let me let me just log into Twitter really quickly so you can see that the one list I made actually shows up there. So um, this is my account. Um, so the research that I just renamed actually shows up here, um, and you can publish it. The list, actually, the inner circle, actually showed up here. I like to follow Nancy Bain's list, so basically she made this list, and I just decided I was going to follow it. Um, so it actually integrates whatever you make into your into your Twitter feed, but. Just to show you something maybe a little bit more interesting, um, my student who follows many, many more people than I do, uh, it makes it for a much more interesting, um, and this is Eric Gilbert's um, account. 
So you can see that his inner circle is much more populated. And people like to explore and try to figure out why, like what this group is right here. So let me, my screen is a little too big. So let me move this, or try to move this. So for example, trying to figure out what makes this a community versus what makes this a community. So some interesting things that we've encountered so far, just from asking people and from people leaving us suggestions. Sometimes if somebody shows up in your inner circle that tends to be an ex, people get very, very upset. So this is a recurring theme again. Like, why is this person showing up in my inner circle? Um, maybe, maybe. Um, so you can delete people. I don't want to delete people from Eric's inner circle right now. But, um, but you can see again who these people are. Um, if you click, you'll drop this person from the list. One thing we'd like to do is add a feature to add people to a list instead of just dropping people, because they actually make it um, much more useful. Can you drag them down to the outer circle? Not yet. That's one of our goals. That's one of our goals. And again, if you look here, um, because he has such a bigger, uh, he follows so many more people, he has a bigger community. Um, so he has an extra community, another birds of a feather community. And what's interesting about this one is that most of these people had had something to do with UIUC. Um, so you can start guessing what some of these communities are, and you might like rename them and say that you know that's the UIUC community, and again in his case you know the easy to miss people are here, um, and the eager tweeters are here, and um, so one thing I'd like to do um, before closing this talk is I just to ask one of you to log in maybe Ethan. I, I, I have logged in. You have I'm logged in. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, it's it's sort of astounding and scary how good it is. So in your in your experience, um, the people that it chose for your inner circle, how well do they how well do you think they fit into your inner circle? Um, I would say the inner circle is about seventy percent accurate, really? maybe eighty okay. percent. Okay. Um, and it does actually a fairly well it's such an interesting question, right? So mm -hmm. it includes my wife, which is good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, people like Ivan Siegel, who runs Global Voices, Papa which is baby. good. Uh, my baby blogs but doesn't tweet. <laughs> um, but mostly what it is is the inner circle is sort of a blend of my immediate personal universe mm -hmm. and probably my two most important social universes, which is to say the sort of Global Voices space mm -hmm. and one chunk of the Berkman space. <laughs> Okay. What's actually most interesting is that it created two groups, okay. and the two groups actually very neatly become sort of cosmopolitans, right? The sort of the global voices, you know, uh, you know, the coolest Bahraini blogger out there, mm -hmm. the coolest Malagasy blogger out cool. there, cool. and then another one which is very clearly the straightforward all American white guys de Girati. Okay. And it just sorts the two, you know, very, very straightforward with almost no overlap between the okay. two. It's actually, okay. it, it's very, very, cool. very impressive. Cool. Can so, you suggest people you should be following? No, no. It's somewhere on our like somewhere on our like hundred things <laughs> list of things to do, but we haven't done that just yet. So one of the things is that, you know, we want to study how well this generalizes. Um, one way to do that is see if people remove people from their inner circle and outer circle and who they add. So far, I mean, because you can only remove people, less than, people have removed less than 1% of, 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 of people on their, on their inner circle or outer circle. But um, our goal with this work actually is to you know, do a quantitative analysis by looking at the logs, but also do a qualitative analysis and interview people. Because when you interview people, you actually get at some of the gist of what's really going on that you don't get at just by looking at server logs. So that's one of our next steps. Um, also, we want to see how people use the client. Do they like the client? You know, one interesting thing about developing a client when, you know, there's just, you know, so few people working on it is that you can't compete with something like TweetDeck, which is like a whole company. Um, so we put a lot of effort into the design, into the fonts, into the layout of the client. Um, you can also tweet from it. I didn't make it clear before. It's kind of, um, let me go back and just, so when you go to the client, So there's a little tweet button up here. You can actually use this to send a tweet, and it will say on Twitter that it was sent by WeMetal. Um, you know, one thing that I would really love, one of my pet peeves, you know, from all the four tweets that I've sent, is that you know, when you send a tweet, you don't want to send something, you have to go all the way to the top. I would really love it if I could, as I'm reading something, just send a tweet right then and there in line, as opposed to having to move, you know, all the way up here, um, and on Twitter and on our interface, and actually type the tweet up here. But um, Basically, I'd like to open the floor for suggestions because we're very open to criticism. We want to make this as best as we can before we start studying it. And just 
ideas that people might have for how it might work in applications that you're working on or in research agendas that you're interested in? Well, what you trained on MySpace is that, so is it taking a linear combination of those? So what we did, we didn't or? do anything on MySpace. We did a model on Facebook, and that's we oh. did that using oh, sorry, Facebook. Oh, yeah, linear sorry. regression is what it is. And have you tried um, other types of models to see how they compare? And did you? Yeah. Then you're using the same model here. We're using we the exact and same model. <coughs> mm -hmm. Checked how well it um, that's what we're tested doing right against. Now. Um, yeah, that's our, okay. our plan to, to find out like in the real world with many, many people. So we have about 600 users now. We hope to get up to a few thousand um, and then see what we get by having lots of numbers of people use it. Yes? Um, in terms of the visual feedback, uh, I'm not sure if that's a priority, but um, as far as I'm concerned, geolocation and have the ability to navigate see geographically who is where and then hop from account to account but you know as if mm -hmm. as if you were seeing the world from from on high. Mm -hmm. So if I could see you, you would be in Chicago and then like Ah you, so know, you mean like some a map like visualization. Yes. For for Twitter? For Twitter or for ah, okay. Or okay. Someone, someone just did a really nice piece of Facebook visualization uh -huh. around this, looking at essentially clustering people's Facebook friends based on looking at their public profiles and then trying to figure out geographic clusters. Mm -hmm. And basically figured out that San Francisco and LA are very tightly yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. tied. Um, basically, Seattle and Portland, no one ever escaped that orbit. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, there are, there are areas where there are a lot more cross-national friendships, and then there are areas like in the Northeast where we basically don't get out of our, our yeah, home states yeah, or home yeah. counties. I would love to Very see that. I haven't done. seen that visualization, Wesley. There, there I'll send it to you on Twitter, that? and then our Thank pie you. will get stronger. Thank you. <laughs> Can you send it to Berkman Friends? Yes, I will. I'll send is there it to you. It's going to go out to the Berkman Friends list, and uh, if I could make it appear over my head, I would find a way to do that. <laughs> so, David, well, in, your, in your list, out of curiosity, um, was your inner circle, um, uh, did it make sense? So, um, yes and no. Okay. Um, so there are. It, it's trouble. It, it's hard for me to th figure out who's a close tie and who's okay. a weak tie. So, um, and why some of the people are. So, um, I uh, I follow like three hundred twenty people. So that's okay. um, more than I actually follow. Okay. And that may be part of the problem. Um, I. There's, there aren't people in it that I want to say, no, I don't. I hardly know that person. Mm -hmm. So it did a very mm -hmm. good job there. But there are people in uh, birds of a, in the other groups that I say, well, yeah, I would have thought they would have made it into the circle. Mm -hmm. So part of my reaction to this, I, I mean, I really like it. Yeah. Um, I have a very quick question about it. But part of my reaction to it is I sort of want to know more about how, uh, and just as a user, what does inner circle mean? So mm -hmm. um, if there were a way for me to click on this and to see what you're doing, I'd be Click on so a link on the page that tells me. Oh, uh, information. What information. Got yes, it. that's what information. I'm looking for. Yes. Um, and the very quick question is: Is this tweetable or bloggable? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I also did and find it a little puzzling who mm -hmm. it came up with. I personally would be really interested in trying it on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and at least in my experience, to me, Facebook and Twitter are really, really different. And this yeah. notion of the inner circle which makes lots of sense in terms of Facebook. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I think there are people who use Twitter in a Facebook-like way. Yeah. And I think particularly if you're doing it in a university environment, a lot of students do because they're following mm -hmm. each other around mm -hmm. the campus and it is a little bit more social yeah. networking. Yeah. And I think what you're finding here is this is a community that uses, where Twitter is more about broadcasting news and mm -hmm. getting news broadcasts mm -hmm. and that notion of inner circle is very, very, it doesn't math as yeah. well. And yeah. so I think in some ways, I, I love the idea, but I think it, it may have been a little too <coughs> untranslated in its mm -hmm. movement from Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and well, there's another point there, which is that, you know, with this version, you know, we, we came up with one generalized model in Facebook, and we decided mm -hmm. to take that model, transplant it into Twitter. But as we're getting feedback from lots of different people about what they move around, 
we could make individual models for a person, or we could make, again, another generalized model for everybody. And what do you do? And is, is tie strength one general model, or are people's experiences and um, you know, how they use the system different? For example, I'm a, I'm a low traffic user. You know, mm -hmm. Should my model be different than, um, than maybe Ethan's? Right, but I think, all right, like for instance, and some of this may be data that you can't mm -hmm. get, because like this you can't get off of Twitter. Yeah. But one of the most, especially people who are using it as, you know, a portal to news, is not even how much you retweet something, but how many times you followed a link mm -hmm. that someone has set off. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're setting up your own client, if you can start collecting things like, you know, if I leave, if I tend to click on links that this person put up. Mm -hmm. If I'm using this as a news service, yeah. that's a huge piece. Yeah. Because the people who send out links and I don't follow them, it's not interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think thinking about what makes, it, it might be interesting to do it as a paper too, what makes Twitter different as opposed mm -hmm. to, how to how to make them look the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Just follow up on my comment. So, you know, the projection you did into kind of a strong and weak work yes. pretty well for Facebook. But I'm wondering if there are like multiple things going on on Twitter and so the projection into two space doesn't seem quite Yeah, right. yeah. And like I said earlier, I mean, spaces are so different. I mean, we took advantage of reciprocity in Facebook and that doesn't exist to the same extent in Twitter as it does in Facebook. You know, one of our clues is, one of our goals is to see just how much it generalizes. Like, if it gets things accurate to some degree, we can say that, look, with these parameters, you can get a good gist of what tie strength is. And that in itself is an interesting finding. Finding the ideal tie strength for Twitter is a much different story. But um, just in, in terms of thinking of spaces for the research, well, first of all, on, on Judith's comment, um, <clears throat> I think this whole question of, of sort of inner and outer circles, I, I think all of this gets really, really mucky. Yeah. And yeah. you know, it's really impossible for an inner circle on something like this to sort of you know reflect my emotional inner circle because you know perhaps thank God most mm -hmm. of the most emotionally relevant people in my life don't. Yeah. So, you know, it's it, I find myself looking at it and sort of going, are these the people whose, whose tweets I take most seriously? Is this a list of people who I generally, who I care about mm -hmm. independent of the content mm -hmm. of it? It's a nice provocation. Yeah. I do think that there's going to be some sort of vagueness that comes into play no matter yeah. what you do. I just wanted to suggest as a, as a research direction on this, particularly based on the Facebook work, as you completely correctly pointed out, Facebook gives you no valence. It's friend or not friend. Mm -hmm. uh, LiveJournal gives you beautiful yes. abilities to do valence. Yeah. And I'm married to an extremely heavy LiveJournal dream with user, and watching her sophistication in carving up communities and then publishing information selectively to those communities is just fascinating. And so I guess part of what I wonder in all of this is that you've taken two tools that have sort of very heavy artifact behavior to mm -hmm. them. Like Facebook has the artifact that every friendship is reciprocal, mutual, as strong as it could be, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Even if you don't have to reciprocate, you do in mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. Twitter has moved into the sort of celebrity position where once you're yeah. over a couple thousand followers, you're probably not going to detail your most intimate thoughts. You're using it as a broadcast mm -hmm. platform. It might be really fun as sort of a third avenue in this to look for something that has taken precisely this issue of strong tie versus weak tie group formation and made it essentially central to the technology and sort of see how it plays out. Yeah, that's an excellent point. You know, on a different note, the murkiness, I think, is one of the reasons why people have just kept it in two bins for so long just strong and weak tie. And in, in some ways, it's almost an art form trying to figure out what is strong and what is weak. Yeah. And there isn't, there hasn't been an algorithm for, you know, one thing that I should stress is that although we decided that we're going to talk about a continuum, we still put it into two bins. Yeah. So, um, like, I would like to further explore what it means to be in the middle. I mean, just as a, for instance, if you looked at a network like LiveJournal, what you're going to find out is that there are sub-communities mm -hmm. where you know, my wife basically maintains a public list, a close friends list, and then a list for a specific subcommunity that she's involved with. Mm -hmm. Any given post on any given day could end up in any of those three. Yeah. But 
within each of those there are stronger and weaker ties mm -hmm. and it, it would be interesting yeah. to think about whether you can yeah. pull apart for me one of the most interesting it. things i think i'm thinking of looking at right now is that if you look at a lot of these small world problems yeah. like nan lynn did a lot of studies like hers were different from milgram's in that they were his were different from milgram's in that they were in one city but um looking at he was looking at the tie strength of the people that got the packages so I may get this background, but I believe that in the beginning they went out to weak ties and by the end they went to strong ties. Hmm. So trying to see, there's so much literature on information flow, but I don't think there's been as much in looking at, you know, what do you send to strong ties and what do you send to weak ties and why? Yeah. And how, how tie strength as a variable um, influences information flow across a network. Like I think that's a, another area that might... Um, I was going to get back to the point that you were making about, you know, Facebook being more social, Twitter being mm -hmm. more informational for, for most, you know, many yeah. people, not necessarily everybody, but given that possible dichotomy that uh, yeah. one way to analyze the Twitter um, differently might be uh, on the, not so much the strength of the tie, but the, the, the rated value of the information. Mm -hmm. And so that you, you know, and then possibly, well, given what they say about weak ties, that you get more different information from the weaker ties, maybe you, you actually find something there about, oh, a lot of the most highly rated information are from some of the weakest ties, mm -hmm. but um, they come up with a different. Yeah, thing. like actually I was thinking like something like Reddit or Dig would be a good way to look at that because you can actually people vote on like how much they liked something. Yeah. I mean, just getting back to this notion of the specificity of, of the Twitter model is that another mm -hmm. part of it, when you think about saying, well, we want to move beyond strong and weak ties, is also to think about what types of relationships exist in these online ecologies that just there isn't a model for very well in, in our day-to-day -day life. And Twitter is really interesting that mm -hmm. way because, for instance, there's all these people who, you know, I might follow them, but they don't follow me and mm -hmm. vice versa. So it's like when I, then the part of the, I think it makes it an interesting interface problem is because even though I know that intellectually when I post something, I keep thinking that I'm posting to a group of people yeah. who I follow, yeah. but the group of people who are following me is a very, very different group. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the same one and it's a yeah. very bizarre um, mm -hmm. set of ties. And I think thinking about how you can use this type of thing to help clarify a type of relationship that we don't yeah. have a good model yeah. for understanding. Can I pose a question to the crowd? Like, how how do you how do you all read Twitter? Do you just you know go to the very top and you know start reading? Do you use TweetDeck and do you use lists in TweetDeck? Like, how do you handle? I'm guessing a lot of people here follow a lot more people than I do. So I wonder. I am curious how many people have the same experience I do, where I tweet, but honestly, the amount that I the amount that I tweet isn't a lot to begin with, but I definitely don't bother to read anymore. Really? Okay, so you produce more than you consume. Yeah. Like, I'm exact opposite of you. <laughs> yeah? I will look at the f whatever is on the first page. Yeah. Or the other extreme would be I'm looking for something that's specific and then I'll do a keyword. Okay. So, not anything in between. Okay. I'm a tip. Yeah? <laughs> um, it, it's, my, it's my 10 minutes of serendipity. So I open up a new browser window, I look through 100 or 150 tweets, I open up the ones that look good in other tabs. Uh -huh. If they turn out to be good and interesting, I repost them. I rarely retweet. I use Via a lot. Okay. Um, because I often... Why is that? Just out of curiosity. Rather than just saying, Donnie said this, and just hitting the button to retweet it or okay. retweet Donnie and do it, it, I will often put my own 100-character headline or something, but I'll credit Donnie for putting it up there mm -hmm. by saying via. So it's my way of oh. having an influence in the conversation rather than just... Mm -hmm. oh. Got it. And you usually only change the headline. Do people use hashtags? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. I'm basically the same as pattern the same as Ethan, except I retweet because it's easier. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm more ego than you. Yeah. Absolutely. Interesting. Interesting. So it's weird, like, I look into Twitter far more than I do into Facebook just because 
the overhead just feels it's, it feels faster yeah. somehow. It seems like I get to the gist of it much quicker. Um, but if you look at the number of Facebook status updates versus Twitter, it's orders of magnitude more. So there's many more people using Facebook right now than Twitter. Um, I don't know how that's changing. Johnny? It seems that it is possible to combine Facebook and Twitter. For example, for me, I have both of these two accounts, and mm -hmm. I suggest the users to, 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 to log on mm -hmm. at the same time with this uh, proper Facebook <coughs> account or Twitter accounts. And uh, for the research perspective, you can compare. Mm -hmm. What is happening, and for the users, they can arrange their friends together. Is mm -hmm. that possible? If people using the Facebook API, you can combine the two. You cannot get into the inbox, which you know we mm -hmm. use some of the inbox parameters to build our model. Um, mm -hmm. But are you suggesting that we take um, information from Facebook and Twitter to make a more holistic model? Is yeah. that possible? That is possible. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If people would have to put in both logins, though, so there's issues of trust and other interface issues. But it is possible to build a model based on both behaviors, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another, maybe different from you, some of you is that because Twitter is blocked in China. Ah, and okay. Facebook yeah. is also blocked in China. Mm -hmm. okay. So, for example, this kind of result for me, it's not as. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. just uh, those frequent Twitters. Mm -hmm. uh, appears in the inner circle. Yeah. But uh, the outer circle is just the same to those 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 uh, not frequent. Yeah. Almost the same. So I'm wondering to that this these instruments these two can be used as to compile mm -hmm. the yeah, also yeah. the same topic to isolate it, different kind of web well, mm -hmm. uh, uh, internet. Yeah. Is mm -hmm. that possible? To a degree. For, for example, to a degree. I yeah. set a, an a application to some some SNS websites mm -hmm. in China, used the, almost the same kind of application, and I compare the same one. We can look up, look, look at some kind of the, the users and compare the same two except two things mm -hmm. and compare what kind of thing anything. You could do something like that. I'm, I don't understand the specifics of what what you're asking, mm -hmm. but. Um, are you saying like look at look at your ties with people on two different sites? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that you could this do. That you could do. People may when they want to cross the wall, they yeah. actually have maintained two kind of society, and they okay. just this is two fascinating kind of com communities. So yeah, if we can do some research on these kind of effects to look at those people who have to cross the wall. Yeah, yeah. And what are their communities? Yeah. Uh, how yeah. can they, they can combine together all of the relationships? Yeah, I hadn't even thought of that. For that me, is. the wall is an ocean, <laughs> and um, yeah, and I just it's like my Greek family is just not not on the radar. Uh -huh. So it's it's interesting to think of it in terms of the, like having active conversations, but just you know in two distinct spaces. Yeah, and yeah. What that it's means not for, only yeah. the the censorship thing, but also perhaps the different concepts yeah. or different. Yeah. Concepts. So in your did you do. do did you look at the communities I built for you? Did they make any sense? Until now, the first man it makes sense, but yeah. the others does not. No, okay, okay. Yes? Uh, I'm curious if you try, thought of and or tried to using your interface with the email, because I was thinking that you would have the content of the email perhaps to use as well as you know, the, mm -hmm. how many emails you send between different people, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And that, that might be mm -hmm. a richer environment to look yeah. at. Um, and then also, I was curious if um, if you took people who had been through a disaster or somehow tied it, like, let's say, Mumbai, mm -hmm. where people Twitter, et cetera, or then it, and tried to use the interface to look at some of the, the Connections of people mm -hmm. and how the information got out. No, we have not done either of those things. Or let's um, say earthquakes. And the same yeah, sort of thing. Microsoft and IBM had built different email uh, clients uh, to address email from um, number of conversations perspective. 
Um, we have not done that with this tool. Um, as far as the disaster relief, I think it's a fascinating idea. There's a lot of really good work um, that's gone on with the Red River floodings in Minnesota and South Dakota, uh, where they went in and looked at how people actually use Twitter for, um, for the response. They went in and coded, hand coded millions and millions of tweets. Um, we, um, if we can get our hands on some data set like that, that might be something that is definitely worth looking into, but we have not done that yet, no. Mumbai might be that. I'm sorry? Mumbai. Mumbai, okay. They looked at, there's certain organizations looked at it from a security perspective. Yeah. Like but so I think the so idea of... We'll help you immensely on that. It's <coughs> uh, Shahidi's new project, Swift River. Swift River. Which is basically designed to figure out how do you deal with the flood of data Mm -hmm. that comes out in the wake of a natural disaster and sift through it. They're interested in essentially quality assurance. They're yeah. Basically, they're a distributed reporting platform. So their question is, how do you get through this and get to the reliable accounts? Because one of the things that we're all discovering is that disaster tweeting is 95 to 99% retweeting. Okay. Um, it looks mostly like there's a little bit of information that comes out and then everyone just sort of amplifies again mm -hmm. and again and again. Uh, Al Jazeera just published this wonderful, provocative analysis suggesting that there were actually 60 Twitterers in Iran during the Iranian Revolution, mm -hmm. and that everyone else was just sort of Retrain. Americans patting themselves on the back and saying, <laughs> you know, uh, look, we're having a revolution out here. But they're wow. doing massive data collection and analysis yeah. on this, and it would be a fun test yeah, bed if yeah, you wanted yeah. to work specifically yeah, on that. Have they done like an analysis and information flow to see who people choose to tweet versus... <coughs> They're building infrastructure. Okay. So their theory is that the next disaster is already around the corner. Mm -hmm. People just grab their tools now in the disaster. So, you know, just as soon as the, they'd finished sort of focused on Haiti, someone grabbed it and built the platform for Chile. So mm -hmm. they're building pipes. Got it. They're not social network analysts, mm -hmm. but they're really lovely open source people. And mm -hmm. if you wanted to come in and do analysis on top of it, that's an easy yeah. uh, introduction yeah, no, that's to that's a good idea. Um, I was just intrigued when you had your, your great question mark slide up, uh, and you said that mapping out your relationships like that, uh, you thought, violated the Facebook terms of service. Yes. How, how so? Um, they have, um, you're, not like, you're not supposed to store data past an X number of hours from Facebook, and that, um, was, has been stored in my computer for several months now, almost a year. So um, Facebook has very specific terms of service for how you use the site, um, for how long you can store information afterwards. And um, that said, um, more than 70% of Facebook apps probably do violate terms of service. But um, that's an interesting discussion I wanted to bring up because it's something I would like to have with members of this community. Um, in terms of how to actually do research and, you know, analyze data um, in the most ethical fashion possible. Mm -hmm. Yes? Hi, I'm going to ask a question that has to do um, with journalism, coming at this from the position of a journalist. Uh, mm -hmm. I was reminded that uh, NPR did a story, and I was recently talked to a radio journalist who was among five people who went into a farmhouse in France. I'm sure many of you have heard about this experiment. And they cut themselves off from the world, except mm -hmm. for Twitter and Facebook. Okay. So that they could think through how they saw the world, if the only way they saw it was through mm -hmm. their Twitter feeds and through Facebook. And they've been writing and thinking, and they're doing a lot more analysis and trying to think about how it relates to them, what their job is. Yeah, yeah. And I think the word that you hear about journalism today is trust, either lack of trust or how do you regain trust. And I'm wondering if you thought at all about how thinking of journalism maybe as news and information, how, whether you can kind of track that within this in terms of how people gain trust to move mm -hmm. from an outer circle to an inner circle from that perspective. Yeah. That's an excellent question because that kept coming up in like the urban rural studies. And Nancy Baim actually did some great work with one of her PhD students in interviewing people in rural areas, trying to figure out what they wanted more to participate more with social media. So we got very lucky in that her work was going on at the same time as ours and we could talk to them about it. Um, the trust problem is really hard. Um, there's different research going on with trust on video um, and audio. Trust with text, um, the literature that I've seen just hasn't been very conclusive about it. Um, and the thing with tweets is that at 140 characters, 
you don't get a lot of the context that you would normally get and the cues that you would use to actually establish. Figure that out, yeah. yeah. But what people do use there is they use reputation quite a bit. So in terms of reputation systems, um, that's probably where you're going to get at some of the more um, trust issues. And so are these people who put themselves into the farmhouse, did they know each other beforehand? Were they strangers? They knew each were other they? through the journalism community. They were from different countries. Okay. Um, one was from Canada, one was from Belgium, I believe, one was from Switzerland. I mean, they, they were, you know, yeah. and they yeah. knew each other to plan this experiment um, and viewed it as an experiment. Mm -hmm. um, so now there's going to be, you know, kind of thinking that develops out of this that they try to put into their work once they've emerged from this. Yeah, so when are they coming out? It just out? happened uh, first week in February, so it's a fairly okay. new. Okay, okay. Yeah, I wasn't aware of this. I th I'm, I'm looking forward to see what they have to say when they do. Right. Um, one of my colleagues actually did a study where he put in information foraging into cloistered nuns oh. um, to see what their um, experience is. Um, but in terms of the, the trust question is excellent. I wish I had a better answer for you. That's um, just a thing. Yeah. But I think trust has essentially changed with you know, the proliferation of weak ties on social networks. So, you know, the $100,000 mm -hmm. is one example, but, you know, I'd ask my father for $100,000, but yeah. for the best restaurants in lower Manhattan. Yeah. But the reason it's also changing is historically, in, in the sociological definition of tie strength, tuss, uh, a strong tie implies trust. Mm -hmm. um, but. Um, one example of where you know trust you can get trust in a weak tie is, for example, let's say you walk down the street and there's a police officer. I mean, they're probably a weak tie, but you do trust them as well. You trust a fireman. Um, you have a lot more of these like different Signifiers. types of relationships yeah. on Twitter than you do in the face-to-face -face world, and it's easier right. to, to separate them face-to-face -face than it is on Twitter. So, if someone that went to the same school with you, do you trust them or do you not trust them? Someone that you know is in your church, do you trust them or do you not trust them? So, it gets even murkier in Twitter than it is. In face -to -face. One of those text-based signifiers you can add. Yeah. Doesn't that, I think I'm about to make a very obvious point, doesn't that suggest that the weak, strong Thai uh, polarity just isn't all that useful in an online environment? Which also suggests yes that it maybe no. it's tied to a geographical... I think, I think one thing it implies is that trust isn't mapped to strong ties, the way people thought. I mean, that, that's, that I believe is true. Um, I believe that there might be several types of strong and weak ties, maybe not just the one magical strong and weak tie that we keep talking about. Um, regardless, people will take weighted sums of all of them to come up with one universal number. But yeah, I also would like to support David's point because in my reading of Granovetter's paper mm -hmm. on strong and weak ties, what he was really interested in was heterogeneous versus homogeneous ties. Yeah. So what he's interested yeah. in is are your ties all the same or are they different? It was a side effect of it being strong and weak. If you mm -hmm. happen for some other reason to have really a bunch of heterogeneous strong ties, it would be hard to have. That would be great. And mm -hmm. if you have lots of weak ties and they're all homogeneous, it doesn't do you any good yeah. at all. Yeah. And so the focus ended up being on something measurable, but that was, it wasn't even the point of his paper. And so I think yeah, for a lot yeah. of things, it is really important to figure out if that's what, you know, both that it's maybe too binary, mm -hmm. but a lot of times it's not even the thing you want to look at. And I think that was a very influential paper, but it should have been like the strength of heterogeneous ties. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it so said that, well, one problem is if you want a lot of heterogeneous ties, you probably also end up with a lot of weak ties. Yeah. But, so he did, I think a lot of people took that from that paper, and that's why so much work after that was in Habofoli mm -hmm. and in terms of similarity as opposed right. to, to differences. Um, there's, there was, there's been a lot of work on homophily, and especially in the health environment. It's here at Harvard, actually, some of the best work is going on in that domain. I guess, I guess because so much of that work was going on, we weren't as interested in, in homophily as we were in... Um, our ultimate goal is information flow. Mm -hmm. So seeing how that happens and seeing how these bonds... Um, well, I'm personally interested in how these bonds evolve over time. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to... Like, I love this work. I think it's great work. I'm curious right. that because this model worked in 2008, when new technologies come along, what we do is we appropriate our face-to-face -face behavior onto any social, right. new social but, media that comes along. But if you're interested, for instance, in homophily, mm -hmm. one question is, like, if you did something... If you look at... Keep your... The Wii Metal interface and say, okay, here's a measure where I want to look at how similar is what this person tweets to what I tweet. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that might tell you other things. And so, if you're looking for similarities, that might mm -hmm. be the pieces to be measuring instead of trying to get at those issues through strength and weakness. So, so yeah. one way to think about this yeah. would be within the application that you're creating, 
um, take a look at some of what John Kelly's work is right now, mm -hmm. clustering blogs around not how they link to one another, but how they link to third parties. And ah, so he's okay. essentially yeah. taken large sets of blogs. His best known work is on the Iranian blogosphere. Mm -hmm. It's sort of more impressive because he doesn't speak Farsi. Yeah. So grab a bunch of Iranian blogs, ignore the blog roles because that's got all sorts of social artifact associated with it. Look to see what everyone links to. Don't really look at the, the links to blogs. Look at those third party links. Yeah. And yeah. he was able to tease out four major and sort of ten minor clusters, and it's work that he did here with Bruce Outlang, and mm -hmm. it's really gorgeous stuff. You've got all that data. It's a little tricky because everyone uses all these URL shorteners, yeah. but if you grab all yeah. those links that everyone's linking to, you could imagine another way of clustering people within this based on sort of what information people have or don't have mm -hmm. coming out of them. That could be yeah. a fun experiment. Well, there's a lot of cool work going on about in about who's important in a network in terms of information dispersal. Yeah. So I mean, up until recently, people kept saying that you want to have high centrality, you know, many, many connections. Um, and there's been some nice cool work recently talking about how it's not just that, but you want to have a, a large mass of people that are easily influenced and will believe just about anything that, yeah. you know, they, <laughs> they hear or see. And that will get stuff, you know, spread through the network much faster than one very central person. Um, the, the Hamafli work is fascinating. I think one of the reasons that we, you know, we sidestepped it a bit was because that we wanted to look at it from just a different perspective. Um, there's so much work with Hamafli. Um, we felt that the field was just kind of saturated a bit with it, and we went, just try something new. I mean, no matter what you do, it still comes down to that. Right. And not just Hamafli, but what more interests me more than Hamafli right now is sort of like complementariness. Um, people always group people by similarity as opposed to someone that might actually you know, provide something different. And that's somewhat what a strong tie brings to the table. So when they look at like, people have looked at strong ties and weak ties in terms of creativity of groups and all, a lot of that been, work's been done in business schools. Um, and so looking at not just similarity, I think is um, just for me interesting. But Wendy, you had your hand up. I don't Thinking about this in terms of, in connection to uh, Helen Nissenbaum's work on privacy and contextual integrity, and it struck me that your tool is providing contexts, um, and so it would be really interesting to get data um, about things like what people call their groups. Do you start yeah. seeing the same terms recurring? Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you add interface to allow people to move members around, do you see that there's a definite sense of where somebody belongs? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. yeah, it's clear that person was just miscategorized like the X yeah. you refer to. Yeah. But in terms of privacy, you could take it a step further. Like one thing we haven't encountered yet was what if people start publishing their inner circles and someone's like, why am I not in your inner circle? And they really want to be, or they feel like they're like, why is, is he or she in the inner circle? <laughs> and um, so that's something we haven't encountered yeah. just yet. But from the privacy perspective, I would love to talk th about this some more because as soon as you start, like one of the, the dangers, like there's this beauty to tie strength when it was nice and ambiguous. As soon as you start putting a floating point number to it, things start to change. And it loses some of that beautiful ambiguity. Um, but with interfaces, you can still keep some of it as long as you don't you know, make everything just very explicit. So there's this, you know, one of my biggest fears with this work is I don't want to destroy any relationships. <laughs> and because um, at the end of the day, like my first one of my first quotes was that what attracts people most is other people, and that's one of the beauties of Twitter. That's one of the, was one of the beauties of IRC, um, and we don't want to. We want to make sure that, like I, like our, I'm in a computer science department. We are builders. We like to understand, you know, the the social forces and the theory behind our work. But we also want to see how we can actually encourage different styles of relationships and hopefully, hopefully not destroy them. One of the things that's always happening in real life mm -hmm. relationships is that they're coming I mean, from you know the sociology literature on social ties is it's always being negotiated. Mm -hmm. Your status, your relationship, always under negotiation. So one of the problems with placing people into these sort of fixed yeah. circles is that you lose the power to continually negotiate the relationship. Mm -hmm. And if they stop being very helpful, you know, mm -hmm. you know, 
want to be able to jettison them from your inner circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they move away, and you, mm-hmm. you know, what, for many reasons, you have an argument, and mm-hmm. there's something you were not expecting, you know, you lose some of that. Yeah. So one thing that's interesting about some of the algorithms, the way we envision using them, is that they they do learn in real time, so based on interaction. So like, so if Ethan tweeted me, um, so we would get slightly stronger, you know, in that realm. Um, if you know something were to happen and I were to remove him from my, um, that would be incorporated to the list. But it would be sort of what's interesting there is the explicit cues versus the you know communication cues. Like you can bring in cues from like personal experience. Um, and say, look, this is what I'm doing now versus what happens from the dynamics of the conversation. So looking at those as well. Um, and again, those are what those are what were interesting in the relationship um, scenarios where our algorithm broke. So I'm really intrigued in that right now, and I'm also intrigued by like the positive and the negative. Um, so for example, in terms of you know political discourse, it turns out that if you really want someone to reply to you, being rude really helps in a political context. Whereas in a technical form, if you really want to get a reply, being polite helps. So this element of context is also key, which so far we've treated as a black box. But um, And in the, in the political s- scenario, getting a reply back will probably give you a negative reply back. Most people don't reply, yes, I agree with you in those forums. They'll reply, no, but did you look at this or did you look at that? Blogs are different. You know, Blogs tend to be more echo chambers in the political, in the pro- political realm. But um, you know, there's a lot of different different features to look at, but I like the idea of looking at sort of like external features that are not captured in Twitter. For example, most of our life does not happen in Twitter. Um, it's good. It depends on who you are. <laughs> True. Oh.